singing hymns to God, the prisoners listen. Little did they know what would come next. Mm. All of a sudden, the earth began to quake and the foundation of that jail began to shake. The door flung open. The chains of all the prisoners came loose.
through some season that I wouldn't choose, but I would never trade them as they led me to you. And I've been through breaking in 23. I didn't understand But when I look back on it I see your hand I trust I trust in God His Savior My Savior Who will never Who will never Sing it again. I trust in God, Savior, my Savior, one, who will never fail. Who will never fail. If it wasn't for mercy, following after. If it wasn't for all those set on chances, where would I be? Cause he rose to my rescue and he showed me real, real, real love and he'll do it again and again and again and again. step in I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered that's why I trust him that's why I trust him I sought the Lord Ooh. and he heard and he answered I'm again. 
Savior, the one, let me hear you, who will never, come on, that's it, he will never, come on, just one more time, real loud, I trust in God, my Savior, my Savior, the one, who will never, who will He will never, he will never. Come on, I trust in God. I trust in God. Woo. Anybody else made a decision this morning? Happy New Year to all of you. First Sunday of a brand new year. Uh, you may be seated. So delighted that you are here. So honored that you are, are part of what God has for us on this first Sunday of a brand new year. And if you're part of our Bonita Valley family, you know that we share communion on the first weekends of months normally. And if you're not a member, that's, you can receive communion without being a member of Bonita Valley. Maybe it's your very first time with us. That's fine. This is not what we own, it is what God gives us. It's not about being connected to this family, it's about being part of God's forever family. It's also not a badge that we've arrived. And sometimes we kind of have these ideas that there's like this merit stuff and, and so if we're good enough, we can receive communion. And there are some faith expressions that if you've done certain things, you're not supposed to receive communion. Let me tell you what, communion is for messed up people. Anybody here qualify? If, if, if there's some messes in your life, this is for you. God doesn't say, get your life straightened out and then I'll help you. God says, I will help you straighten out your life. And communion is how God does that. How he's done it for us. How he wants to work in our life. He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And that's the message of communion. And what communion reminds us of things, it's, 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 it's memory markers for us. And so I'm going to ask you to take the cup, you'll find it in the seat caddy right in front of you. I'm going to walk you through this, we're going to all do it together. The Lord's Supper in the early church was a family meal, and this is meant to be something we share as a family. All of our online family, friends, wherever you're watching, whatever time it may be, you can share communion with us. You can get, just push pause and you can get some juice and some bread and then come back and you can share with us as we in this house share together what, what's so incredibly important for us. And so when you come to the first tab and pull it back, you come to a piece of bread. The Apostle Paul writes that it was the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread and when he had blessed it, he broke it. Would you break the bread with me? He said, this broken bread is me, it is my body, broken for you. Isaiah tells us again that he was broken for our broken places, he was wounded for our wounded places, he was pierced for the places we're pierced, he was humiliated for our humiliations and by his stripes, by his wounds, we are made whole. His wounding doesn't just tell us that he understands us, it tells us he can heal us, that he cares about us. I did a funeral on Friday and we were praying for the family, praying for Diana and, and Chris Camacho and their daughters. They had a premature little one born, Cassandra was born early, lived 13 days and passed away early. And so we had a funeral for little Cassandra on, on Friday and still praying for the family. The Bible says God is near the brokenhearted. The Bible says God blesses those who mourn because there's mourning in life. Everybody loses something or someone at some time. That loss happens in life, but God says there is, there's wisdom and healing in the house of mourning. You'll not get over things, but I'll help you get through them. And there are many, I, I talked to a lady after the first service whose mother just died this week. We never get over losses, we get through losses. Because that's what the bread is all about. I don't know what you need to get through, but there's a God who will get you through. And the bread is a receipt that whatever you're dealing with, he dealt with, that you might be whole. God is a God of wholeness and completeness. There is no, there's no 
limits in his presence. So let's take a moment and pray. Father, thank you once again for this bread. It was broken for us because we're broken. It was not just a reminder that you know, it's, it's a statement that you've healed us. And it's just a matter of time until that wholeness is complete. I pray for healings of minds, hearts, bodies, grieving hearts I pray for. I pray for marriages, I pray for singles, I pray for students, and I pray for seniors, our children. God, I pray today that in every person's heart there would be a healing wholeness because of what Jesus did for us. And now we receive it as the gift that it is by simply saying, yes, in Jesus' name. Let's eat the bread together. Thank you, Lord. The second tab you pull back is the, the grape juice. Jesus said this cup is a new covenant, a promise, but beyond a promise, it is a commitment I make to you that I will never, ever break. You break yours, I don't break mine. It's not a contract. If the party, the first part keeps their part, the party, the second part, no, no, no. God says, I'm not making a contract with you. I'm making a covenant with you. I will always do what I say. I will always come through. I will never change my mind about you or what I promise you. And we're going to take a moment together because there are all of us in this room that have made mistakes and messed up. But he has forgiven us and cleansed us and washed us. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, as we receive this cup, we would remember not our failures, but your faithfulness. That you have been a friend to me. You're the friend who sticks closer than any relative, brother, sister, father, or mother. In your word you declare, can a mother forget her child, even her nursing child? He said, it's possible, unlikely, but I will never forget you. I've engraved you on my palms of my hands. There are nail-pierced hands that will never forget you and who never forget us. And I pray we would never forget how loved we are, how treasured we are, and how forgiven we are. In Jesus' name, let's drink the cup together. Thank you, Lord. You can place the cup back in the holder. Then would you stand with me? Because we need to give him our thanks. With our hands, our hearts, our praises. Would you do that? Would you tell the Lord, I thank you for your love and grace and healing and hope in Jesus' name. And the Apostle John says, you'll know you've passed from death to life, not just because you love God, but because you love who God loves, because you love others. So before you're seated, you got to give a happy new year. We don't need to shake hands off with virus stuff's going around, but you can give a fist bump, a smile, a happy new year to somebody around you. Give at least three or 10 happy new years. And then you may be seated. If this is your first time at Bonita Valley, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. If you want some info on BVCC, simply complete our online connect card. Here's how it works. Scan the QR code you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you with the camera on your smartphone. Open the link that will take you to connect card. You'll find a number of connecting options including first-time guests, prayer requests, I want some info on a Bonita Valley ministry. Check the appropriate connection box you're after. Push submit and we'll get back to you ASAP. And if you are a first-time guest today, please stop by Guest Central at the end of this service and pick up a special gift bag we have just for you. We'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about some things coming up for you and your family at Bonita Valley. This Thursday, BVCC Women begin a new series with best-selling author Lisa Turkhurst entitled Good Boundaries and Goodbyes. The purpose of this study on boundaries isn't so that we can shove love away. Quite the opposite. This is so we can know what to do when we very much want to love those all around us really well without losing ourselves in the process. Good Boundaries and Goodbyes should bring relief to the grief of letting other people's opinions, issues, misplaced desires, and unhealthy agendas run our life. 
And most important, we'll see how we can love others well without losing the best of who we are in the process. So let's get started. Every Thursday, BVCC women have two opportunities to connect at 10 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. in the Life Center gym with childcare available for moms. BVCC men are about to launch into a new six-week series called The Future You. It's time to become who God has made you to be, to see yourself the way that He does and live like you believe it's true. God has planted a seed of endless potential within you. It's time to water it and cultivate it. It's time to step into the future you. BBCC Men happens this Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. in the Fireside Room of the Life Center. The new year is just around the corner, and that means Bonita Valley is getting ready to launch into 2024 with life building and connecting opportunities. Throughout the week, we have ministries built to keep you spiritually fit and physically fit too. On Mondays, we host a super fun fitness experience called Dance Fit at 6 p.m. in the Life Center Gym. Followed by Moms Connected for moms with kids of all ages at 7 p.m. in the Family Room. On Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m., Primetimers gathers for connection, fellowship, and time in God's Word. Tuesday nights provide life-building support groups like Celebrate Recovery, Grief Share, Divorce Care, and Living Hope, our cancer support group. Wednesday evenings are night for the whole family. There's ministry designed just for kids called Bonita Rangers and Bonita Girls Club. Then there's Bonita Valley Youth for students in middle and high school and our weekly Wednesday night service for adults. On Thursdays, our Ministry to Women has two opportunities at 10 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. in the Life Center Gym. And our Ministry to Men gather for their Bible study at 6.30 p.m. in the Fireside Room. On Saturday mornings at 8 a.m., there are more fitness opportunities with boot camp for those wanting to get into better shape physically and spiritually. Mark your calendar for all these amazing opportunities at launch into the new year, beginning the week of January 8th. Are you exhausted as a parent? Are you tired of your kids bossing you around? Yeah. Then you need to come to the Parents Rising Conference. The Parents Rising Conference? Yeah. It's a one-day event to help your child in this crazy culture. Who's speaking? Dr. Gary Chapman, Arlene Pelican, Bill and Pam Farrell, and Sally Burke. It's happening Saturday, March 2nd at Bonita Valley Community Church in San Diego. To register, go to happyhomeuniversity.com slash conference. We believe God has entrusted us to be managers of our time, talent, and treasures. We believe He wants us to use temporary resources to make a real and eternal difference in our world. And that's what giving at BVCC is all about. When we give to God, we see lives change and transform, both others and ours. There are three ways to give at BVCC. Online at bonitavalley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 833-303-9325 or by mailing your offering to BVCC 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California 91902. During our Sunday services, we offer a professionally staffed nursery that will lovingly care for your little one up to two years of age. We also offer an outdoor patio area and a family room with TV monitors for parents who choose to keep children under two years of age with them. Pastor Davida and her team lead incredibly fun ministries for preschool and elementary aged children in the Life Center Gym. During today's service, you can take notes, sign up for events, and even give using your smartphone. Simply use the follow the service QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Let me tell you something about New Year's. New Year's are automatic. Ready or not, here they come. Sort of like birthdays. I don't want to give you the bad news, but this year you got a birthday coming if you didn't already have it. And if your birthday's on Christmas, I feel sorry for you because you get one present for anyway, So anyway, but but... You're going to have a birthday. You can't stop them. You can lie about them, but they're coming. 
It's because new years are automatic. Great years are always optional. Great years are always the payoff or the product of great choices. Let me just tell you how, how New Year's work, okay? How, how life works. And here's how New Year's work. Great choices, great year. Average choices, average year. Bad choices. Anybody feel where this is going? Bad choices, what? Bad year. See, our year goes as our choices go. That's not just what I tell you. That's what God tells us. That's what Moses told the children of Israel. They were getting ready to move into a new era, a new place, a new plan. And he tells them this, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Today I have given you the, say it, choice between life and death, your choice. Between blessings and curses, your choice. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the, what? Choice you make. Now God has choices for us, but you make it. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live, might really and fully live is what he's saying in this word, life. Verse 20, this is the key to your life. What's the key to your life, to your future, to your new year? Your choices. Let me tell you something about your choices. You make so many choices every single day. Your choices are more important, way more important, way more life-shaping and future-determining than your circumstances. So we often say, I have a happy new year. No, you don't just have one, you choose one. And, and, and it's not the circumstances. It's not the start, stock market goes up or it goes down. Things go good or they go bad. It's not the cer- how, how I can prove that is because two people can face the exact same circumstance and it breaks one and it builds the others. One gets bitter and one gets better. Same thing. They went through the exact same thing with totally different results. Why? Because of their choices. Because of how they chose to respond to their circumstance. It's not the circumstance that makes or breaks us. It's how I choose to respond. Which is why this weekend, on the first Sunday of a brand new year, I want to start a brand new series with you simply titled, Choosing a Great New Year. New Years don't just happen, they are chosen. And over the next several weeks in this series, we're going to talk about and look at some choices we need to make and how to make them to experience a great new year, a great life. And let me just give you one of the first ones right away. It's not even in your notes. It's not on the screens. One of the first great choices you can make to make a great new year is show up for this series. Some of you already did. You're halfway to a great new year right now because you showed up. Now, you had other choices, other things you could do honestly. Now, let's get real. Some of you didn't show up because you wanted Somebody dragged you here or promised you lunch. Whatever it is, make them pay. But, but you're here. I challenge you to invite a family member or a friend to come with you because you've never met anybody who doesn't need a great new year and a great life. But they're not going to have it because it just happens. It's not happenstance. It's choices. And we're going to walk through and talk about the choices and choices we need to make and, and how we need to make them. And I can't encourage you enough to show up. I'm going to be here because I believe this series is literally life and future shaping because that's what your choices will do. They will shape your future. They'll shape your life. But not just this series. Wednesday night, Pastor Jordan starts a brand new series. You want to be here. If you've never come to a Wednesday, there's stuff all over the campus for every age group. We have our students and and, and Pastor Dan, our student ministry uh, up in the gymnasium. We have children's boys and girls On Tuesdays, we have a recovery night, celebrate recovery. Some of the greatest people, greatest stories of victory are happening, people that are showing up for celebrate recovery that God has for them. They're an amazing group. Uh, Grief recovery, divorce recovery. Uh, Coming up will be be confident kids. Um, You heard in the video announcements, men's and women's start up again on Thursday. Great studies for both of them. All of these are amazing opportunities. you got to choose if they're going to change your life. And if you choose them, they will change your life. 
We have so many things happening, and they all involve choices. And for the next few moments, we're going to look at unpack many of these throughout the series, but I want to give you just three essential choices that are essential to a great new year and a great life, and let's get right to it, and here's the first one. Essential choice number one, we must release our regrets. Quick question. Anything you regret in 2023? Anything you said you wish you hadn't said? Come on, how many of you, as soon as you said it, you're like, I got to undo this. Anything you wish you had said you didn't say? I should have said that. Anything you did you wish you hadn't done? Anything you wish you'd done that you didn't? Regrets. The, the, the challenge for all of us is that we have experienced regrets. We have things we regret. And, and if, if you said yes to any of those things and I say yes to all of them, I got an article for you about regrets. And it goes like this. I booked my reservation on Wish I Had Airlines. I didn't check my bags. Everyone carries their baggage on this airline. I dragged my luggage for what seemed like miles in the Regret City Airport. I could see that people from all over the world were there with me, limping along under the weight of bags they had packed themselves. I caught a cab to Last Resort Hotel. The driver drove the whole trip backwards, looking over his shoulder. And there I found the ballroom where my event would be held, the annual pity party. As I checked in, I saw that all my old colleagues were on the guest list. The Dunn family, woulda, coulda, and shoulda. The opportunities couple, missed and lost. The yesterdays were there too, too many to count. But all would have said and shared stories. Shattered dreams and broken promises were also on the list along with their friends, don't blame me and I couldn't help it. And of course, hours and hours of entertainment will be provided by the renowned storyteller, it's their fault. As I prepared to settle in for a really long night, I realized that one person had the power to send all those people home and break up that pity party, and that person was me. All I had to do was choose to return to the present and welcome the new day. Pity parties are a choice, and leaving them are a choice. See, every one of us, there's not a person in this room who hasn't visited the city of regret. We've all got regrets. In fact, studies show if you don't have some regrets, you're not a smart person. I mean that. If you don't regret anything, you missed a lot. Because there's stuff you and I didn't get right. If you don't have regrets, ask somebody in your family, what should I regret? They'll give you a whole list of things. Right? And I, I listened to a TED Talk, and, and the person on the TED Talk said, if you don't have regrets mentally, you, you, things aren't connected. So I'm not telling you that you and I don't, I oh, mean, I wish... Oh, no, regrets happen in life. We all visit. Listen, you drive through the city of regrets. Just don't move there. Don't live there. Keep going. Don't stop. Don't get stuck in the city of regrets like the Apostle Peter almost did. We're told his story. It's, it's, it's so powerful in John 21. And it's after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Peter knows he's alive. This is post-Easter, post-resurrection. Now, the disciples had a hard time believing that Jesus really was alive. The women told them, but hey, who believes women? And, and then they didn't believe the stories until Jesus showed up and said, you should have believed the women. They told you the truth. And, and he showed them the, the nail prints in his hand and the wounds in his side and said, I'll meet you in Galilee. And he was gone. So they knew he was alive. Peter was very sure Jesus was alive. Peter just wasn't so sure about his life. And the reason was because of his failures. And because he regretted what happened on the night Jesus was, was betrayed and crucified that, that he didn't think he could ever, ever move beyond. See, you know the story. The story was Jesus is preparing the disciples. He had told them very plainly, I'm going to be suffering in Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be crucified. And then three days later, I'm back. And they're like, what does he mean? He meant what he said. But they didn't really get it. 
And when he's sharing the Last Supper, the, the communion with them, and we, we just had communion together earlier, he's telling them very pointedly what's going to take place. And then he tells them that when I'm arrested, when they, when, they, when they come for the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered, and you will all run from me. And they're like, shock, we're not going to run from you, Jesus. And then Peter, bless his heart, Peter always said stuff others didn't even think of saying or want to say. Peter said it. And then Peter says, Lord, if all these other guys bail on you, you got me. I will never bail. I'll never run. Listen, Jesus, I will die for you. And he meant it. He just couldn't do it. And Jesus knew that. And Jesus said to him, Peter, before morning, before this next morning, three times you will have denied that you even know who I am. Peter got quiet. Well, what would you have done? I'm going to die for you. Yeah, not really. Here's what you're going to do. And then the story is... When he's arrested in the garden, they all run, just like he said they would run. He knew. The shepherd was attacked and the sheep scattered. And then Peter follows at a distance. At least he had the courage to follow, but he's at a distance. And then there's a fire, and he gets close to warm himself because it's a cold night. And a girl recognizes him. Aren't you one of him? No, 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 no. And so three times, he now denies. He curses. I don't know. I don't know this man. And after the third time... Well, Luke tells us what happened after his third denial. Let me pick it up. Luke 22, verse 61. Just then, just when, just after Peter had denied Jesus for the third time, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. But don't miss this one. Peter not only denies Jesus three times, Jesus knew he would. The third time, he says, I don't even know the man a rooster crows, he looks up, Jesus is looking right at him. Peter's like, I'm never, ever going to forget that look. I'm never going to forget looking in the eyes of Jesus. And when I said, I don't even know who you are. And Peter remembers, Luke writes, what the master had said to him. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and cried and cried cried. That's regret. He didn't just fail. He regretted at the core of his soul what he had done. Regret goes deep. It's not a moment of failure. Regret goes deep. But we learn a lot about failure and regret from Peter's story. That's why the Bible is so full of stories to show us us. To show us us and other people. I don't know about you, but I see things better in others sometimes than I see in myself. Or I, I, I see lessons better than I hear them. And so in John 21, we learn some things about failure and regret. And, and you and I have got to learn this. It's very important. And what we learn from Peter is he's sure Jesus is alive. He's not sure about his life. He knows that Jesus is back, but he doesn't think he will ever be back. Not to where he was, not to what he was supposed to be. So he and the disciples, they obey Jesus, they go to Galilee, but he says, I'll meet you on the mountain. They don't go to the mountain, they go to the lake. They go to the, to the Sea of Galilee. That wasn't what he said. But they go there. Because they got to Galilee and Jesus didn't show up. That's like their home territory. And Peter's not the most patient guy. That's why I like Peter. Anybody like Peter? Like some of you are right now, let's go, let's go. That was Peter. Let's hurry this thing up. Jesus wasn't showing up on Peter's schedule. So he says to the other disciples, I'm going fishing. Now you got to trust me, you can read it yourself, John 21. He said, I'm going fishing, and the other disciples said, we'll go with you. So what? No, that's really important. Because here's what we learn about failure from Peter. Failure doesn't destroy giftedness. Failure diminishes vision. Peter was still gifted to be a leader. When Jesus saw him, he says, you're a reed, you'll be a rock, you are a leader. He was gifted to be a leader. And even though he failed, he was still leading. How do I know? He said, I'm going fishing, and they all went with him. There's an old axiom, axiom that says, he who thinketh he leadeth, but hath no one following, is only taking a walk. How do you know if you're a leader? Look over your shoulder. Is anybody following you? All of us are influencers. That's what leadership is. 
on different levels. I'll give you a little clue. When you're at your office, when you're at school, when you're, wherever you are and something happens, who do people look at? That's the leader. Do they smile? Do they laugh? Do they enter in? And that's who Peter was. And his failure did not diminish his leadership, but it diminished his vision for his leadership. See, see, here's what I mean. When Jesus called Peter, he called him to stop fishing for fish and start fishing for people. When you catch fish, they're alive, and you catch them, and they're dead. When you catch people, they're dead, and they become alive. It's life transforming. Jesus said, you got skill sets for fishing that I want to use for people, and he called him out of that. You're gifted not as a fisherman, but as a fisher of people. But Peter went back to fishing for fish. I can't tell you how many people have gifts from God that they settle for lesser visions for, lesser purposes for. Amazing singers. I'm, I'm not saying you can't be a professional singer, but if you got a voice, you're meant to sing it for God. Not just in God's house, but wherever you are, you sing it for God. When you sing it for you or for something else, it's a lesser vision for a greater gift. I don't care what you're gifted in, you are gifted in that to make a transforming difference in your life and somebody else's. But when we live in regret, we miss, we lose the vision for why I have what God gave me. You and I need to understand, once again, when it comes to this, this vision thing, that we often lose it, and that's what regrets do for us. They are vision, life diminishing, which is why Jesus would not allow Peter to live in the city of regret. He went to find him. How do we release our regrets in the same way Peter did? Let me just give you two of the ways. We release our regrets. We must own up to our mistakes. We've got to own up to them. Three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? More than what? More than the fish? More than the boats? More than the disciples? More than all of it. Do you love me more than anything else? Because if the issue of failure is love, what or who do I love most? And so three times, Peter's not, I'm not saying he's, he's brilliant, but he figured out, I denied him three times, he's asking me three times. Yeah, there was a connection. Jesus wasn't trying to rub Peter's nose in his failure. He was trying to release him from his failure by giving him a chance to say yes instead of saying no. Three times he basically said, no, I don't love him, and now I give you three times to say, yes, I do love him. He was actually calling him back. He wasn't rubbing his nose in his failure. See, confession is not admitting to God. It's, it's just being real with God. And the reason I confess is so that God can release me. See, he wants to release me, but unless I confess, unless I own up, I can't be released. Now, this is an old story, and please forgive me for this story I heard years ago, but I love it because when I was a kid, and, and I, when I grew up, most of what I did was totally, in, totally, totally incorrect. And if you grew up, so I grew up with, I, as a kid, I had a gun on my side. I, like, I was a cowboy, I had a cowboy hat. I wore a gun, not, not a real one. When I was like, like five, six, seven, I got a BB gun. When I was 10, I got a shotgun. Like, like I had a gun when guns weren't cool. Just, anyway, so I'll stop there. So, so I had a gun. I did all kinds of stuff. And, and, and so in the story, there's a boy and his sister, and they go to his grandma's house for, for a few days, and he's got a slingshot. I had a slingshot. Again, I, they're probably illegal in California, but I had a slingshot. I, didn't have, I, I loved that kid. David swung his eye. I had one with a rubber band, and I'd pull it back, and I'd shoot his stuff. And this little boy had a slingshot, and then he was shooting his stuff. He never hit anything. He would shoot at birds, never hit anything. And then his grandma had a duck, and he got a big rock, and he pulled it, and he hit it. He never hit anything, and he, and he hit it, and he killed it. <sighs> he looked around, didn't see anybody. He hid the duck, but his sister saw how many of you have a sister that, or a sibling that always sees what you do? <laughs> they're like God. Maybe they're more like the devil. I don't know. But anyway, so they always see what you do. And then his sister starts blackmailing him. The grandma says, okay, I want you guys to wash and dry the dishes. And she goes, he'll do both. You know, and she said, remember the duck. <laughs> so he does both. She gets some other chores. And she says, he'll do mine. No, I'm not. Said, remember the duck. He finally had it. So he goes to his grandma and he cried, Grandma, I, I pulled my slings out. I, hit, I killed your duck. She says, I know. I, saw, I was looking out the kitchen window. I saw it all happen. <laughs> and I forgive you. 
I just wondered how long you were going to let your sister blackmail you. <laughs> I just wait for you to come tell me so I could tell you. I forgive you. You don't know how much God wants to forgive you. Before you ever asked, Jesus said again and again on his way to the cross, Father, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, for they don't really understand what they're doing. Well, they know that they know they're doing things, but they don't get they don't get the depth of what they're doing to me or to themselves. So when you confess to God, you're not telling him God, God never goes, really? No, God wants to release you. He who confesses his sins is wise. If we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all of our unrightness. So one of the first things that, that, that we have to do to, to, to release our regrets is to own up to our mistakes. But here's a second thing we learn from Peter. We must refocus on our mission. Now let me explain that. Three times Jesus says to Peter, do you love me more than these? And three times Peter says, yes, Lord. Now I'm telling you, he gets what this is about, and I'll tell you why. Because it says, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. Do you love me more than these? And then it says, and Peter was broken. He was grieved because Jesus had to ask the third time because he knows he denied three times. But after every time Jesus asked him, do you love me more than these, that wasn't all Jesus asked. Then he said, feed my sheep. Do you love me more than these? Yes, feed my lambs. Do you love me more than these? Yes, feed my sheep. What was that? Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Some of you didn't, but I'm, I'm going to answer. That was his mission. You have failed but you still have a mission. See, giftedness doesn't get destroyed by our failures. Vision gets destroyed. And often after we fail, you and I, we fixate on our failures and we forget our mission. And God wants you to forget your mistakes and focus on your mission. I don't mean forget them like they never happened. We forget them because God forgets them when we, when we confess them. But once you confess them, they're gone. If God says, I don't remember them, you stop remembering them. And if the devil reminds you, I know what you did, you remind him, it's gone. And I know what's going to happen to you. So I'm just saying, you got to know, you got to know that you're released by God. And then you focus on what God has for you because he's not finished with you because the callings of God are without repentance. That means God never changes his mind about us. When he gave you a gift, he never takes it back. His gifts are permanent. It's just our use of it becomes lessened with failure and regret. In fact, I read you, to you earlier what, what Luke said, and, and, and it's so important. I can't read it again for the sake of time, and you better act like you remember it. i got to start all over. But Luke tells us that when Peter denied the third time, then he remembered what Jesus had said. Remember that? Just act like you do. <laughs> Peter remembered what Jesus said about how he was going to deny three times before morning, what Peter needed to remember and rehearse was something else Jesus said. See, it's interesting how we recall some things and forget others. Many times we forget what we should remember, and we remember what we should forget. And Peter remembered when he failed that Jesus said, yeah, you're going to fail, but he forgot what else Jesus said. I want to show you because this is so important. Same night, same setting, Luke 22, verse 32. And Jesus says, I have prayed for you, Simon. I prayed for you, Peter, that your faith, that your trust will not, what? Fail. So when you, what? Ah, oh, say it out loud again. When you, what? Third time is the charm. When you, what? Jesus promised you're going to fail, but you're going to recover. And when you recover, strengthen your brothers. I'm not finished with you. When you recover, help those who need to recover. I'm not, I'm not putting you on the sideline. I'm putting you in the game. So, listen, some of your greatest ministry will come out of your greatest hurt. It will. 
See, and I go, God, why did I go through this? God isn't the giver of bad things, but he turns all bad things good. And sometimes the hurts, the wounds in our life, they sensitize us. There's an old Helen Steiner Rice poem I love, and the line simply says, only through tears can you recognize the suffering that lies in another's eyes. So spare me no heartache or sorrow, dear Lord, for the heart that is hurt reaps the richest reward. See, there's many, many times when you've gone through something you spotted in somebody else. I told you earlier, my favorite ministry is here. And I, I love all of you and what you do. But Celebrate Recover, I just love seeing people's lives turn around. And all of our Celebrate Recovery leaders have recovered themselves. They've all got stories to tell. Why are they so committed? Because they've recovered. Because their greatest hang-up, hurt, habit, has now become their greatest platform for saying, I got out, you can get out, I will help you. Some of you have been through divorce, or you've been through loss, or you've been through bankruptcy, or you've been through, I don't know what you've been through. But I'm gonna tell you this, sometimes the thing that you have been through is what God is gonna use in your life. Because he's not finished with you. He's not. It has sensitized you. And so he says to Peter, and when you recover, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Satan has prayed to destroy you, but I have prayed that you're not going to fail. Jesus' prayers are more powerful than Satan's requests. And when you have recovered, strengthen your purpose. There is ministry on the other side of failure and regrets. You and I need to understand, again, to own our mistakes, to refocus on our mission. We release our regrets to God and with ourselves, which is essential choice number one. Here's the second. Essential choice number two, we must give up on getting even. I'm not going to ask if you were hurt or wounded or messed with in 2023, because you were, or before. Everyone has been. As it's been written, if tears were permanent ink, we'd all be stained for life. There's not a person in this place who hasn't been hurt, wounded. If you could just see this streaks on everybody's face. Everybody's been hurt. Everybody's been wounded. Everybody's had things done to them, said to them. The question is not, have I been hurt, wounded, or wrong? The question is, how did I respond to the hurt, the wound, and the wrong? We sometimes respond like the guy who was bitten by a dog with rabies. You know the story. The doctor walked in to the ER room, emergency room, tells the guy, you're going to survive, but you need a series of shots, four of them, over the next 14 days. It's kind of uncomfortable, kind of painful, but you're going to survive. You're going to make it. The man asked, can I have a pen and paper? So they gave it, and he began just writing feverishly. The doctor said, you don't really need to write down all this treatment stuff because we'll give that to you in writing. And the man said, that's not what I'm doing. I'm making a list of all the people I want to bite before I get treated. <laughs> okay, it's just you and me. I won't ask you if you won't ask me who's on your I want to bite list. I didn't say we will bite them. We just want to bite them. I want to bite them back. Some of you, you're like, you're just so cool. Yeah. Okay, now I got a question. How many of you, when you see somebody, they run a light, they get pulled over, you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That's, they're on your bite list. They got bit back. So, so we all have this, this list, but, but here's what's important to understand. Lewis Meads, in a, in, a, in a great book called Forgive and Forget, Healing the Hurts We Don't Deserve, writes the following. The problem with revenge is that it never gets what it wants. It never evens the score. Fairness never comes. The chain reaction set off by every getting even takes its unhindered course. It ties both the injured and the injurer to an escalator of pain. Why do feuds go on and on? The reason is simple. 
No two people, no two families ever weigh pain on the same scale. That is profound. Uh, let me explain it. It takes me a while to get some things. What he's saying is, I always think the pain done to me was greater than I think my pain was to you. I always think it hurts me more than what I did to you. Now, I know what I did to you hurt, but it didn't hurt as bad as what you did to me. So when you hurt me, I hurt you back more. Then you hurt me back more because you feel it more than I felt. Because no two people feel pain on the same level. And so we get tied to this escalator of increasing pain and anger. It's been said that if we all live by an eye for an eye, the whole world will be blind. Because the only way out of woundedness and hurts and pain is forgiveness. Peter raises the forgiving subject with Jesus in Matthew 18. Come on, he's hanging out with like 11 other guys and they're, they're, they're bugging him. Now, how many think Peter was bugging them? But they're bugging each other. How do I know that? Because Peter goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, how often should I forgive my brother when he wrongs me, when he messes with me, when he messes up? Seven times? Now, again, let me give some context. In biblical times, in Peter's day, it was kind of taught by the rabbis and the teachers that you should forgive somebody three times for doing the same thing to you. Three times. And fourth time, go for it. But, but three times, you forgive them. So Peter doubles that and adds one. Seven. Jesus, I am being magnanimous here. And Jesus is not, not seven, but seven times 70. That's... He's not just saying 490. That was a phrase that meant you don't keep score. As many times as they ask, as many times as it's needed. There's no limit to forgiveness. And then he tells them a story. He always tells them a story. His stories, we call them parables, word pictures. And they always had a punch. So you and I, we know these stories. The hard part about me telling you something, you already, I already know that. Now we ought always, don't always know it. Because it was always a kicker in Jesus' story. There was something they didn't expect. I don't have time to teach you on parables, but parables always have just this kicker. You didn't see that coming. Great jokes have the same thing. Didn't see that coming. And so Jesus' story, they would, they would buy in. They would try to figure it out, just like you do. They'd jump ahead. And then he gives them a, that wasn't what I th where I thought you were going. And he tells them a story of a king who loaned money, and kings often loan money because they were the ones who had it all, and they would invest in others, and businesses would grow. He kind of divested their money and, and grew businesses. And there was a man that the king had given, what Jesus said, millions of dollars. I mean, huge amount of money. And then he calls the guy in and says, time to pay up, time to return the loan. And the man can't do it. And he, says, and he begs the king, please give me a little time. I'll pay it all back. And the king says, no, throw him into debtor's prisons, prison, take his wife, take his kids, which they were allowed to do. And he begs him, and please, I will pay. give me a little time. Now, Jesus' audience are all going, man, this guy, he couldn't pay that back in multiple lifetimes. This is, this is a debt he'll never pay back. And that's what Jesus wants us to understand, that this man owed a debt that he could never, ever, ever, ever pay. The king had mercy, pity on him, and he released, he canceled his debt. He forgave him, which means to release from a debt. Now, how many of you, if you got released from your mortgage, it's paid. We go, any of you, some of you who don't smile much, you would smile. <laughs> Cars paid off, colleges paid off. I don't mean by the government, I mean it's paid off, but, but, but everything you've got, every bill you have is paid off, everything you owe is paid off. Come on, how many of you, like, like so you, you would throw a party, you at least have go home and you can't wait to tell your wife and kids and family and spouse or whomever it is. It's not what this guy does. When he leaves the presence of the king, he goes and finds a guy that owes him 20 bucks. He'd just been forgiven of a multi-million dollar debt, but he doesn't really feel forgiven, doesn't really feel released. He goes after a guy that owes him 20, he grabs him by the neck and says, pay me back everything you owe me. And the man says the exact same thing he just said, give me a little time, I'll pay it all back. I just heard that. Yeah, because you just said it. But he would not have mercy or pity or forgiveness on the man. And he has the man thrown into debtor's prison. Now the other servants, this really distresses them. And they go back and tell the king what this guy did. Now the king isn't happy. 
calls the man back in, says, I forgave you. I released you from so much. Could not you have released from so little? And now, he said, throw him into prison. Not just debtor's prison. There's a different Greek word for it. It's torture. Throw him into torment. And then the type is going, yeah, I got it. And, Jesus, and so will my heavenly father treat each of you unless you release your brother from your heart. Of all the things Jesus is telling us in this story, and there's a lot, he's telling us this, that when you and I don't release somebody else, we imprison ourselves. That when I don't let go of your debt to me, I become a prisoner of that debt as much as you, more than you. There are people that have hurt us that have never thought about us again, and we've never stopped thinking about them. So who's in prison? So who's the one who's enslaved? The one who won't let go. The one who who is focused and fixated on getting even. It is so important for you and me to understand that, that forgiving isn't only about releasing others, it's about releasing ourselves. I don't have time to really unpack forgiveness, but let me give you a couple things real quickly what forgiveness is not. On the screen, forgiving is not overlooking the debt or hurt someone caused us. It's not saying it doesn't matter. It does matter. The king was a good bookkeeper. He knew exactly what this guy owed him. He wasn't a sloppy bookkeeper. Forgiving is not denying or ignoring the wrong that's been done to us. It's not denial. It didn't ever happen. No, it's real. we got to get real with us, get real with others. Forgiving is not the same as trusting. People get very confused with this. I can forgive you, but that doesn't mean I should trust you. In fact, if I forgive you, I probably should not trust you. Yet. Because trust isn't a gift. Trust is earned. We'll be talking more later this year about trust, but trust is earned. Don't trust someone who hasn't earned your trust because trust is built. People trust all. Don't trust ever. Well, trust the Internet because it's all. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so we're, we, we need to verify Trust and verify. Build trust. So those are things forgiveness is not. So what is forgiveness? Dr. James Dobson helps us. Here's what he says. I'll put it on the screen. Dr. James Dobson writes, forgiveness is giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. That's forgiveness. Forgiveness is releasing you from your debt to me. Forgiveness is releasing It's choosing to give up on getting even. It's surrendering our debts and the debts of others to the one who paid for them all. I can't encourage you enough and listen so carefully to me. Those who don't release others find themselves in prison, not just in prison, but tortured. In fact, let me just say something you may or may not get, but demonic powers play on unforgiveness. And people that will not release somebody else are not released and they love to see us chained and bound up by our hurts and wounds and our anger. I have seen people that once they forgive, they're healed. Because so much of what happens to us is tied up in our anger and our hurt and our will to get even. And when we surrender to the one who makes everything right, there's healing that comes in our life. There's release and forgiveness. When you give up on getting even, you move forward. And when you don't, You don't. So if I'm going to experience the best new year and the best life, I've got to give up. I've got to choose to give up on getting even because he paid for it all. And God will make sure that it all gets even in the end. He says, I'm the judge. I'll take care of it. But God's getting away with it. (laughs) No, no, God's a good bookkeeper. He knows exactly what is owed and who's released and who is not, because they choose not to be. Then in Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19, we're given a third essential choice for experiencing a great new year. Isaiah writes, Isaiah 43, verse 18, he quotes God. God says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on or literally live in the past. See, I am doing a what? Uh, I got to make sure you're still here. Be sure. See, I'm doing a what? New thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? It's it's not that it's happening. You just don't see it. I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Here's essential choice number three. Don't settle for past 
successes. When God says forget the former things, what former things? He's not talking about regrets. He's not talking about hurts and wounds. He's not talking about what's done to us. I don't have time to read you all the verses that go with all of these things, but the context, if you back up like three verses from this verse 18, go about verse 15, 16, you'll find that God reminds the Israelites of his deliverance from Egypt when he led them out. He led them out. He parted the Red Sea. They walked through on dry ground. When the Egyptians tried to follow, he closed the waters on them like you would close your fingers on a wick and snuff it out. God said, I snuffed out your enemies. That's what I did for you. I led you out miraculously. And then God says, now forget that. Oh, what? No, he's not saying don't recall, don't remember it, don't tell your children about it. The word forget means, he says, don't dwell, don't don't live in it. Celebrate it, teach it, learn from it, but don't live in it. Because if you live in yesterday, whether it's success or failure, you'll be stuck in yesterday. To experience today and tomorrow, you've got to forget your successes. You've got to forget what happens so you can experience so that you can perceive that God isn't finished. That you haven't seen all that God has for you and wants to do in you and through you. God wasn't saying don't recall them. God was saying don't live in them or you'll miss what I'm doing now. And i got a question for you. Now, some of you have been pretty honest today. Others of you, like, not so much. I know it takes a while. Some of you don't trust. Well, let me tell you who lies to you the most. Okay, are you ready? You. We lie to ourselves. So I want you to be truthful with yourself right now. Okay, you can lie to me. Be truthful to yourself. Here's the question I've got for you. What do you think and talk about most, your past or your future? What do you think about and talk about most, your past or your future? No matter how great our past wins may be, God has more for us. He says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You haven't seen anything yet. Paul writes in Philippians 3 verse 13, no, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it. God, all God has for me to be and do, but I focus on this one thing. Doing what? Forgetting the what? Past, looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to what? Uh, just one more time. To what? Reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God has, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Paul says, I forget my past. He's given this whole list of things he had accomplished and done. And he says, I throw it all in the trash because it's not yet what God has for me. Pope Browning, may your, may your, your, your reach always exceed your grasp. What does that mean? There's more. Don't just stick for There is more. And God says, there's more. So Paul says, I'm going to keep reaching because there's more ahead of me than what's behind me. God isn't finished with me. God isn't finished with you. In fact, listen carefully. This is so important. God is calling us from memory to expectancy. He doesn't want you just to live in memories. He wants you to live in expectancy. Don't live looking back, live looking forward. It's not where I've been, it's where I'm going. It's not who I was, it's who I'm going to be. It's not the prizes I have, it's the prizes in front of me. Don't live by memory, live by expectation. And what's next is a new level of growth and greatness in every area of our life if we'll refuse to settle for less. It, our past is meant to get us on our tips toes saying, God, what's next? So how do we do that? Well, that's what the rest of the series is about. you got to show up. <laughs> that's called a teaser. If you want to know how and what, you got to show up because it's like all we can handle for one day. Because, listen carefully, new years are automatic. Ready or not, here they come. Great years are always optional. Great years and great lives are made up by great choices. It's not your circumstance that determines your greatness. It's your choices about your circumstances. 
Your choices are one of the most powerful, life-shaping, future-determining facts in your life. We're going to talk about that. That's why you need to choose to be here. And three of the choices you and I need to make, it begins with releasing our regrets. Essential choice number one. We all have them. We've all visited the city of regret. Just don't live there. Don't move there. Keep going. Peter learned how by admitting his failures and by refocusing on his mission. Don't forget your mission and focus on your failures. God forgave them, so keep going. The second essential is we've got to give up on getting even. You have been hurt. You have been wounded. So have I. People have said things. People have done things that wounded us. The challenge is how am I going to respond to that wound? And if I respond by trying to get even, I don't imprison you. I imprison me. Some of us are stuck in things done to us so many years ago. That person, listen, some of them have even died. And you can still forgive them. Because see, forgiveness is not because you ask for it, because I release you. Some of you can write letters to somebody. You do an email, you go, where do I send it? Doesn't matter, just write it. You say, I release you, because I want to be released. Because God released me, I release you. It may have known, may not have known what they did to me, but I release you because I don't want to live in a torture chamber of memories. I want to release you. Because the one who releases gets released. Don't let demonic spirits torture you with painful memories of your past. You release them. And then the third is you and I, the third essential is you and I don't settle for past successes. Don't settle. Paul says, I keep reaching. Don't stop because you're not there yet. And that's what this new year is all about. And if you will do these three things and what we're going to talk about in this series, at the end of 2024, you're going to say, this was a great year. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me? God, help us. I thank you today for how many hundreds were here today. Because they made a choice. They had all kinds of choices. And some of them got drugged here by somebody else, but they came. I pray for them. I pray for all of us that we would start a new year with a determination to make great choices that will shape and form this year and our lives. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, not because we're ashamed or embarrassed or any, any of that stuff. It's just that I'm easily distracted. I kind of have an addiction to distractions. It's movements. And what I need to see, I need to see with the eyes of my heart, not the eyes of my head. And sometimes I just got to get real with myself. That's what I ask you to do. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, right where you sit or online, wherever you are, whatever time, whatever place, God just is amazing with his appointments. You just simply need to pray, and there's no form prayer for being right with God, but you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I admit I have missed it. Your best. I received the gift. When you suffered and died, you paid my debt, and I receive my canceled bill in Jesus' name. And I don't just believe in you. I want to follow you. I believe who you are, but I want to make a difference in my life and how I live my life every day, and I will follow you as you teach me. And to as many as say yes to him, he gives you the power to become the sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name. 